Hello and welcome everybody to the third of four events uh, from the Minnesota Historical Society to discuss shared spaces and public places. I'm Tom Weber and we're discussing case studies both here in Minnesota and nationally where places and spaces have been renamed or reclaimed. We are gathering online in our own homes or offices. I suspect most of us are uh, joining from the ancestral homeland of the Dakota and the Anishinaabe people. And today we're gonna to talk about college and university campuses specifically. They've been the sites of several renaming and reclaiming efforts. And specifically we'll focus on the University of Minnesota and Yale University. Um, and that means we'll be talking about one case study where a renaming effort was successful and another where it was not. Princeton, Stanford, Rutgers, Clemson, the University of North Carolina, this is just to name a few places where campus building names have been reconsidered and renamed when they had been named after historical figures who endorsed racism, discrimination, and exclusion in the past. And that is the case with uh, what we'll be talking about today. Students and faculty often lean on historical research and interpretation to develop a more complete understanding of, of the past in ways that address past injustice and support diverse college communities. The Minnesota Historical Society uh, believes in cultivating curiosity and guiding inquiry to foster a more empathetic, inclusive, reflective, and informed community. The goal today is to provide space for critical reflection on the way history intersects with contemporary issues and concerns. The people you're hearing from today are working to expand our understanding of the past and using that understanding to guide thinking about present conditions in order to shape a more inclusive future. And as a side note, there will be a short survey at the end. We would love to hear back from you uh, upon the conclusion that will be at the end. So let's get this conversation started. My first guests worked on these uh, matters as students. So I'm very happy uh, to welcome Jay Yates, who is a student at the University of Minnesota. Uh, during debate and a vote uh, to rename several buildings. That vote was not successful, which we'll be talking about here. Uh, Jay, thank you very much uh, for being here. Katie McCleary was a student at Yale University when the school changed the name of a residential college that had been named for John C. Calhoun. They changed it to honor Grace Murray Hopper, a trailblazing computer scientist. Katie is also um, with the Little Shell uh, Chippewa tribe. Uh, Boujou Katie, thank you for being here. Um, I don't see Katie, but uh, my technicians on the back end, I know will be uh, working to uh, to make sure she's here. So Jay, I'm just gonna start with you while we're, <laughs> we're waiting for Katie to pop back up. How did you get into these efforts? We were talking beforehand. You were a freshman. Uh, this was a few years ago. How did this, how'd this even happen? Yeah, I, um, I came to the U as a freshman, um, kind of non-traditional student uh and i took a, a course through the american studies department um and it was sort of a, a history course but with like a feminist lens um and it was led by a graduate student um named sarah atwood hoffman um and she approached me uh after a um uh one of our classes uh and i had expressed interest in in studying history and so she asked if I would help her with this um, project that she was working on. Um, and it was called A Campus Divided. It was basically um, a deep dive into some of the uh, documents of uh, various leaders of the U of M campus, um, including uh, Lotus D. Kaufman, um, Wiley, uh, Stanton, several, several administrative um, people. And so, I was spending like 15 hours a week in a little <laughs> at a table, like just going through all of these documents um, for for the exhibit. And then once the exhibit actually uh, debuted, uh, there was tremendous student response um, about sort of like learning how these um, white men had shaped the the racist. Um, environment of of the of the u and so uh there was a big uh student-led push to rename um kaufman union mainly because kaufman union is where uh most of the uh multicultural groups are housed um and where like the student like a lot of these multicultural student groups meet and so 
finding out that it was this building that was named after this segregationist was really um, really hurtful for, for students, frankly. Um, and so they wanted to, well, we actually, we, we had a bunch of forums, we had a lot of student-led um, discussion about changing the um, name of the building. Can, I can get into that. Mm -hmm. sort of well, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting, I think. So the, again, the thing, one of the things happening here is that we know there are people who are interested in these efforts elsewhere, at other college campuses. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting note. Ultimately, this was an unsuccessful effort to change the name, but this started actually not as that, right? This started, did, did, did I hear that right? This actually only started with the goal of doing an exhibit that yes. would be on campus. So the fact that from the exhibit, which was so informational, then led to a movement to, mm -hmm. well, while we're at it, we should change the names. That that actually was a second chapter uh, that was not, I guess, necessarily anticipated at the beginning. Do I have that right? Yeah, exactly. So the, um, the actual exhibit was um, kind of, uh, it was, it was Sarah's um, uh, part of their project for grad, for grad school. Um, and it was also led by one of the um, faculty emeritus um, from the Jewish studies kind of department. Um, and her name was Riv Ellen. Um, and so it was, it was supposed to be an exhibit that was looking at um, kind of student surveillance historically on the U's campus and the, the repression of communist socialist um, uh, organizing, um, the repression of black students, the exclusion of black students, um, and just sort of looking at the history of the U in regards to a, a wider trend of, of anti-communist surveillance on campuses. And so it started as that. And then the exhibit, I think, was <laughs> more popular than like anyone really anticipated. I mean, like as a topic, I'm sure I was interested in it as a topic, obviously. And like, you know, the people working on it were very interested in this. But I think that we just underestimated like how students would relate to like hearing this information. And I think we also took for granted like that people hadn't seen any of this, that like this wasn't common knowledge, that no one had really looked at any of the the papers from the desk of the president. Um, so yeah, the, the student response was basically to organize forums about um, about changing the names because they they didn't want to have their cultural programs hosted in a building uh, that's named after a guy that was a open segregationist. Um, yeah, and uh, the documents about that are are on the campus divided um, site. But yeah, I I think that ultimately it was unfortunate that the regents made the the final decision because student support for changing the names was actually pretty pretty overwhelming. Um, so. Well, and, and just to give people some context, there were four buildings that ended up being at the center of attention there. Again, this isn't not just in the exhibit, but then when the effort moved to renaming, it was Kaufman Memorial and then uh, Nicholson, Middlebrook and Coffee Halls. But you mentioned Kaufman named for Lotus Kaufman, who was a, a University of Minnesota president in the early part of the 20th century. And I think I have this right, Jay, from some research I did myself, but the, the line I'm about to read came from, there was a black student who showed up at campus, but actually had a dormitory assignment and they realized, oh, you're black. Like, it seems like it was a mistake because after one day he was told he couldn't stay at the dorm. And I believe it was this student's parent, maybe father, who wrote to President Kaufman and the line that I'm reading here was from a letter that he wrote back to the father where President Kaufman said, the races have never lived together, nor have they ever sought to live together. So to your point, Jay, when you're doing this research and it's this homework, this was a private letter. Mm -hmm. This was a private correspondence between the then U president and a student's father. So there's no reason why we would have known that Lotus Kaufman said that at that time thus the need for historical research. Right. Um, yeah. And there was also another, the thing too, was that 
through the course of this research, we realized that this happened more than once. Um, that like, you know, Lotus, Lotus Kaufman really, this was, this was a stance that he never took like officially, but it was obviously like a stance that he had. Um, and that was kind of true of a lot of the officials at the university at the time was like, you know, segregation was never an official policy. And so they could really kind of claim that like, well, you know, we've never, we've never had a policy about black students staying at Pioneer Hall. Um, so we can't, we can't really speak to this issue kind of. Um, but actually there was, there was an effort to have an international house on campus as well. And, um, Eventually that effort was, um, I, I think it was either suspended. I don't think the International House ever fully got up off the ground, but black students were also excluded from that. And the whole point of it was an International House. Um, and so like, I think, I think that it was all of these things together um, that really painted a very different picture of, of Lotus D. Kaufman as like this, you know, beloved, um, uh, president of the U. Um, I think, I think that for students that were looking at this in a modern context, they were also just really uninterested in this narrative of, well, he's a product of his time. Like, I think that <laughs> there were plenty of other people that Lotus was corresponding with that actually objected to his decisions and were vocal about like, actually, no, the NAACP is saying that this student wants to live here and you're also not doing anything to find alternative housing for this student. You're putting that onus on them. This is discriminatory. Um, but leadership at the university was, like I said, able to, to claim ignorance of that. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the larger context. So we have Katie back. Um, uh, Bonjour, Katie. It's good to have you here. <laughs> and um, thank you for reconnecting. And you were at Yale. This was these two things were happening within a couple of years. I don't know if they were ever exactly at the same time, but at Yale, there was a residential college named for John C. Calhoun. And as a Midwesterner, I don't think the concept of a residential college is as prevalent out here. So can you just explain what that is? What is a residential college? Sure. Well, um, my apologies for having some technical difficulties in the beginning there. And um, I also just want to take the chance to introduce myself, too. Um, so I am Little Shell Chippewa, and I grew up on the Crow Reservation in Montana. Um, so Shodaji, Hanabat, Itchik, Baleja, Babalik, Shichishuk, Biesh, Gumna. Hello, everybody. Um, it's good to be here with you all today. So yeah, I went to Yale College and graduated in 2018 and um, was one of the student organizers um, sort of from the period of uh, the fall of 2015 into, um, into 2017. And um, residential colleges are basically just dorms, but they also have community events um, within those dorms and they have what used to be called a master of that residential college, which was one of the things that we also pushed to rename to head of college, um, given the um, associations that master has in the United States um, with slavery. So it was, there was a number of different things we were pushing for, renaming Calhoun College, changing the name, the title of master were two of those, those things. So were you aware at the time, just as a cyber, because this was our first conversation in this series, when this came up, were you aware of what was going on in Minneapolis with the name of a lake here that was named for John C. Calhoun? Sort of on the periphery, but actually, um, so the sort of the group of students that I was a part of, we called ourselves Next Yale. Um, and we were really building actually from um, movements on other campuses. So specifically um, University of Missouri, um, Virginia Commonwealth University, Ithaca College, all of these sort of, um, you know, other students on other campuses um, at the time. So sort of that fall 2015 time who were asking for, um, you know, more resources for students of color on campus and um, equality for students of color, more funding for 
historically under-resourced, um, you know, programs and departments like ethnic studies, African American studies, um, Indigenous studies. So we were actually, I think, really building from uh, student activism at other um, universities, but did also know that there was sort of this conversation happening in Minnesota too. Jay, how, did you look to students elsewhere uh, like Katie did, or was this um, uh, more insular? I don't know what the right word would be, but was this just kind of you students doing their thing, or, or did you also have consider that you actually had this network just beyond the U as well? I think that like students at the U at the time were definitely like aware that other places were were doing this, like aware of like a more national conversation about sort of history and, and stewardship and all that. But I think that the U, I feel like students that were organizing for this and, and to clarify, like I was definitely like involved in like the student organizing, but I feel like I was kind of called on more as like, okay, like you're presenting like the research information and like, you know, the information that we're gonna bring to the regions to like get them to change this name. And so I feel like saying that I was an activist in that space feels like kind of odd, I guess. Like, I don't know that what I was doing was really student activism, but it wasn't not student activism. So it's like weird, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think that students at the U really thought that you know, we have this whole exhibit and we have all of these documents, like there's like, we're, we're going to bring these to the regents and they're going to have to like, let us change these names. And like that, so obviously didn't happen. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I, I think that a lot of student organizers didn't really think about trying to connect formally with other universities because they felt that the the evidence spoke for itself i guess um and it, yeah i didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you but you no, actually no, at the, by the end of it you did have the support of the president of the university who then took it to the board and there is a dynamic between a president and a board of regents where a lot of times most of the time what the president recommends with some minor changes is usually approved so i i don't think it was illogical necessarily for you to think that you had that support but then of course it's always the final decision so that's that's where it always yeah. ends up i bring that up because it's interesting for students who are thinking about this now at, at a college you know i think one of the themes we're hearing in this series that we're doing is that you're not alone and there are people even if it's not in your own geographic community who you might be able to lean on um, and it sounds like katie you definitely had that as well you know it's interesting here uh in minnesota john c calhoun um who you will have then explored the history of as a, a advocate for slavery, a very vocal advocate for slavery, never actually stepped foot in Minnesota. He happened to be Secretary of War uh, when what became Fort Snelling was built, but that's it. So John C. Calhoun's connection to Minneapolis and this lake that had been named for him was already very tepid, but he was a Yale grad <laughs> in your case. He, he, went, he went to Yale. Did that change the dynamic? Uh, you know, I don't think so as much, um, in part because um, so many buildings at Yale have an association, or the the names of the buildings at Yale have the, that individual had some association with Yale. But I think more so, uh, there were people who had gone to, you know, had been in Calhoun College in, you know, the '60s or the '70s, who felt really strongly about being a part of Calhoun College. The, I guess one of the things I should have explained more is that the residential colleges sort of become part of your identity as a Yale student. So when you go into a new space, you say, I'm part of X college. It's a, it is a, um, a way that you, it's a community you identify with automatically as a Yale student, Yale undergrad. Um, so people have really strong, you know, feelings and associations with these places. Um, and I think that it was part of the, our work to try to, you know, explain to some of these alumni, you know, the community at the community of students has changed so much from when you were there. The the faces, the identities, the people who are here, you know, at the time at Yale College is very different. It has changed, and um, I think 
we were really pushing for making the space a lot more con inclusive as a community space. But I think tied with that is about, it was really about resources and support too. So it was, you know, the renaming was really like an acknowledging of um, that, that the community had changed and that um, there needed additional support and resources for those new people as a part of our community. Um, and actually, you know, we had a, a, in some ways a similar situation where um, the uh, Yale Corporation, now called the Yale Board of Trustees, decided not to rename the college. Um, and instead, what we did as students, actually, it, today would have been, um, so April 29th, 2016, this exact day, we held a renaming ceremony. We said, we have the power to rename this building as students, and we can decide what we want to call it. It doesn't matter what Yale Corporation says. So we had this event, um, and we said, from now on, this college will be no known as, formerly known as Calhoun College, FKAC for short. So the spring of, for the rest of that semester, that which was the spring of 2016, leading into the fall of 2017, when we went into new spaces, we said, I'm a part of formerly known as Calhoun College. Um, and so it was, I think that that recognizing, you know, where power lies is something that um, was very important for us. And ultimately, the university did decide to appoint a committee, that, similarly, a committee on establishing renaming. And the committee recommended that the president rename the, the residential college. Um, but students weren't a part of the process at all at that point. They decided to name it Grace Hopper College, but students didn't weren't involved in renaming it Grace Hopper College. So it was kind of a mixed response, honestly, because we had said we had this whole renaming ceremony. You know, we we went through that process, we made that transition, and then you just decided this without any community or student input. So it's just interesting to think about what does the process of renaming involve. You know, how do we bring voices in? How do we include people to make renaming, to bring everybody along? You know, bring those alumni or whoever who are um, really tied to that name and bring our new people that are part of our community along. You know, how do we do that? Um, and I don't think that Yale necessarily modeled how to do that. <laughs> That's so interesting though, because, you know, there there is a point when you're organizing, you have to figure out, and we did this in our last two conversations, who are the like, who actually renames it? At the U, it's not the president of the U can't, you know, by fiat just say that. Um, technically, it's a board of regents decision. It sounds like that's similar to how it is at Yale. The president can't just do it. It has to be what was then the corporation, what's now called the board. So there's, so if you're at a university, you're probably going to be going up and working with and engaging with the board. There's some kind of board of, of trustees. Yet, you did a direct action. You were organizers who said, you know what, that's fine, but we're renaming it anyway. And that's frankly the first time in this series that we've heard about that, where um, someone trying to get something changed just said, even though you didn't do it officially, we are doing it as a people. And uh, that's an interesting thing how did that come about, Katie? And frankly, is that yeah. something you would recommend for other students or whoever elsewhere who are trying to do this elsewhere? I mean, to me, when I think back on that decision to do that action, I think it was very much informed by the fact that um, there were years and years of um, uh, student organizers and activists before us who had um, you know, been calling for Calhoun College to be renamed. The Calhoun College had been, it had been named that for over 80 years. And uh, so I think we just sat down and actually some of the students that, some of the other student organizers, their parents had gone to Yale and had been, had been organizing against the residential college at that time. So you have generations of students, you know? And so we just said, look it, We've been doing this for decades and Yale hasn't done anything. So let's just do our own thing. So I think it was really actually learning from our elders, you know, our, the organizers before us. That's what made us think to do that. Um, yeah, I think so much about organizing and 
on campuses, and, and of course this is tied to renaming, is that it's about caring for the students who will come after you and making it a better place for those students um, and learning from the people who came before you. I think there's a sidebar that there was actually a descendant of John C. Calhoun who was a student. There was. Who's actually, I believe, also an African-American, is that right? Who was yeah. on your side, wanted to change it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're in the moment we're actually going to transition to two faculty members. You know, you have students involved, you also have faculty members involved. But before we do that, I want maybe just a quick sentence or two from both of you. Again, because there are students who want to go through this or interested in going through this. And Jay, frankly, it was unsuccessful on your end. And Katie, as we learned from you, it was successful but kind of, right? There was a, a, a second chapter to that that you um, wasn't, it wasn't as ideal for you. So what would be your advice to people who are watching, who are interested in doing this, um, you know, where they are? Uh, Jay, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I, it's interesting because since, you know, the renaming, um, I, I feel like I've been more involved in student activism in, uh, in other ways, and especially right now at the U. And I think that even though the direct action approach didn't work for, for Yale in, in full, I really think that that's an approach that we should have taken. And it's an approach that a lot of students are taking right now with our current president and, and issues around policing on campus, which is a whole other um, issue. But I think that direct action has been much more successful um, for students and and also maybe maybe even if it's not successful as far as like getting the thing changed that you want changed it does give students that come after like a place to start I think in a way that just having conversations and forums maybe doesn't do because I think that at the U there's been um, kind of building building momentum and building of like student understanding of what power they actually do have um, and how to kind of consolidate that even after students leave. Um, and so there are a lot of groups like Students for Democratic Society that do a lot of work um, that it's, that's more direct action. So I, I think I'm pro <laughs> direct action. Um, that's, that's what I would say to do. Katie, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, I also, um, when you first asked that question, I was like, this is such an interesting way to think of successful versus unsuccessful, because I think that sort of to Jay's point, like they have been building momentum. And so I, I think that um, there's ways to think of this work as more of, um, you know, moving towards an end goal rather than like success versus, you know, mm -hmm. not successful. But I will say I, I think that um, part of the work, I would definitely recommend that people work within their communities in whatever ways that that is, because we found that um, also working with New Haven organizers really pushed the university as well. It was it had to be people from outside the university pushing as well as people in the university. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting point. I think Jay maybe would say we haven't changed the names, but maybe the to, to your point, Katie, we haven't changed them yet is the uh, is, is because there are still people, I think, that are still very interested in doing that. So we're going to thank the both of you for being here, but you're coming back. You're coming back at the end for a QA. and a And we want to hear now from two faculty members at the University of Minnesota who were part of the effort that Jay was talking about with the four buildings uh, on campus. Dr. David uh, Chang, who is the chair of the American Indian Studies uh, department and a, the Distinguished Knight Professor in the Department of History. And Melinda Lindquist is a professor in the History Department and soon to be Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the College of Liberal Arts. Aloha and welcome uh, to both of you. Thank you for being here. It's interesting. I want to start with what we were just hearing from the students. If we could just pick up one point real quick, and maybe Melinda, I'll go to you first. There is a dynamic, and we actually talked about this a little bit last time in our conversation about Justice Page. If students are at the forefront of this, guess what? Students leave. They graduate. So when we were talking with Justice Page students, or the former Justice Page students, and the teachers who were part of that, they said, we realized when this school year started, when they did it, we had one year to do it because all, otherwise all of these students were going to graduate and we were going to lose our momentum. What's that dynamic like on college campuses too, right? Because that's the same thing, isn't it? I think, I mean, I think it definitely is the same thing. And I think when we look back, especially to some of the cases that um, David and I researched in terms of 
the building names, that's a really long-standing strategy of university administrators is to just sort of hold out on making any type of change um, because the students are only going to be there from, you know, for one to four years. And it's a way for an institution to really resist change um, and also to really exhaust students at the same time, mm -hmm. right? So they're resisting change. Students are still demanding change, um, but, but they can definitely play this type of a waiting game. Um, but I think that what's been really powerful over the past couple of years, and especially when we when I had the opportunity to um, you know meet Jay before we started this program, is the ways in which the students at the University of Minnesota, and I think at many universities, are really doing the work of passing the baton to each other to making sure that these issues maintain uh, continue to be at the forefront um, of um, of their agenda. Um, and continuing to push forward. And so I think that type of continuity is incredibly important. But I will just say that the work that um, students are doing, this isn't this is an added work. It is an extra work. It is an extra set of burdens. Um, and of course, they are incredibly committed to making sure that the institutions are better and stronger for the next students that come that come after them. Um, but we, I think we have to be really, really aware of how taxing this type of work is for students and to be very, very mindful, uh, mindful of that. David, when you came in, you, you mentioned you served on two committees. There, there was a process set up at some point. Was that after the exhibit had, had been displayed on campus or were you actually part of the exhibit to the best of your memory? I came in after the exhibit that Jay is talking about, the campus right. divided exhibit, which was really, really important. And, you know, and in kind of the emails that set this up, one of the things that we're supposed to talk about is faculty leadership. But I really, really want to emphasize as Melinda is and as Jay demonstrated, student leadership. Students really lead the way, not only led, not only led the way here at U of M, but lead the way in these sorts of things. And then they they pull institutions and faculty along behind them, they, but they create the opportunities at an enormous cost to the students, right? And so institutions need to know that this, even though it doesn't always feel like a service to some of the members of the institution, that this essential service that is being provided is being done by, by students. So the Campus Divided exhibit happened. Um, a lot of students working with Professor Riv Evan, Ellen Prell, and then I just, we haven't talked about it, but just the national context, not only of universities, but the politics of memory, okay? This is a time when we're talking about Confederate monuments. This is a time that we're talking about place names, not only on campuses, but off campuses, right? So that is the larger context of the politics of this conversation. So there's the student context, there's the larger national context. It creates this, uh, uh, a campus divided exhibit, and then out of that came a committee chaired by the, the dean of the um, College of Liberal Arts, or, 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 or called for by the College of Liberal Arts, um, who's Dean John Coleman, which was on principles and procedures for renaming. Yeah, and it had a lot of faculty on it and some, some students as well. And then after that, that kind of went to the president. And then the president and the vice president um, put out a charge for the creation of this second committee on which Professor Lindquist and I were both served on that committee. And it was chaired by Dean Coleman. It was co-chaired by Dean Coleman and Professor Susanna Blumenthal from the, from the School of Law, from the law school. So that's kind of the genealogy there, but the whole national context is important to, to remember. But it, it's also, it, it also seems important to both of your points that especially an institution of higher education, and and I don't and, and I'm not you know I don't know that I you you you're even necessarily saying this in a negative light, but they will want some kind of process. They will want to be able to say they did this the right way. And so, for example, you had that committee formed where you could then do the research or you could come up with the process. And so, people who are maybe just starting down the road of this should either what expect it or maybe even propose their own ideas it seems right if we're coming up with ideas um to that david it would be hard for me to give recommendations to other other situations and other movements because on the one hand yes you can expect an institution that emphasizes process to want a documented process and documented principles at the same time 
time matters and time is of the essence. And these things slow things down quite a bit um, in the effort to create things that look legitimate and permanent in the eyes of an institution. So that institutionalizes a politics that's not inherently institutional. And that, and that outweighs students like Jay, right? Or it has the potential to outweigh students like Jay and a, a whole cohort of students. And then maybe also to create procedures into which they have less um, touch. You know, it, it's much harder for them to access. So something that starts there gets shifted into a different kind of a process. And so I understand why it happens, but I also see the costs involved in it from the point of view of people who are organizing movements. So Melinda, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, the second committee, you wrote a really long report. So Jay was talking about all the all of the um, research that uh, Jay did, you know, alone in the in the in the library, but that had that was then followed up. There's a very long report, and I think we have a link to it that we'll we'll share in the in the resources. A very long report that was then created to say, here is the history. This is why we're interested in focusing on these certain former leaders and administrators. This is what they did. What what was that like? Um, I mean, I think it was. I mean, it was really eye opening because I think, right, I going into the project, I had no idea about um, what the um, the name holders of these different buildings. I really had very little um, sense of their history. And I think that, again, speaks to the ways in which and going back to the sort of larger picture that David is, is suggesting is that we're now living in a moment where institutions are increasingly requiring of themselves and being required by um, the people that are stakeholders in those institutions, in this case, universities and their students, um, to actually know this history and to have a better sense of it. And so I was, um, I mean, I was really struck, I mean, by the very different types of ways in which administrators were participating in different types of, you know, surveillance of people around um, political practices. The um, the one of the people I, I looked at most closely was President Coffey. And he was this really, really um, interesting president in that he 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 comes after um, President Ford. Um, president Kaufman essentially um, he, he he ends up you know he ends up dying, um, and he's replaced by President Ford. And President Ford comes in in the early nineteen late nineteen thirty nine early nineteen forty, and he really says very clearly both to the university as well as to the larger community um, that the University of Minnesota has an open housing policy. He goes on the record quite clearly, and I would say the nat the the sort of historical context here is important because. If the university, for example, had had segregated housing, that would that could have been completely fine. Plessy versus Ferguson was the law of the land. Um, you know, lots of institutions were segregated. The issue at the University of Minnesota um, is that there's all of this sort of um, lack of clarity around policies and sort of like claiming that really things are the way that they are because this is the way that people want things, um, denying African Americans who are interested in having access to housing, that access to housing, and then basically participating in a process of exclusion. So really, it's a case of the University of Minnesota not being in line with segregation, but practicing a policy of housing exclusion. So President Ford comes in, and he clarifies, and he actually has to he clarifies in public and he also clarifies in his private communications to the, the administrators beneath below him um, that we have an open housing policy. He's in office for, um, he's a president for a very short period of time and he gets followed by President Coffey. And it's during his administration that we see the university reverting back to a policy of segregation, of not segregation, of attempted exclusion, and attempts to do so actually by building, Jay mentioned a little earlier, um, this international house, which was an idea that Kaufman threw out in the 1930s because there was a group, an organizing committee, um, and the name of the organizing committee, I can never, it's a, it's a lot, it's the, it was the All-University Council Committee on Negro Discrimination. Um, 
And when we think about sort of student activism, it, we might be tempted just to just think about it now in the context of this building renaming. Um, but the reason that we have these rich records is that students organized against Kaufman's policies, against Coffee's policies um, in the 1930s and in the 1940s. And so there is this effort to um, actually in an attempt to remove, because in that period of time where Ford was the president, an African-American student moves into the dorms and there is an effort to remove that student. And so now this notion of the international house Reemerges. Kaufman always had like thrown it out there in the 1930s. Maybe we could have a place for black people on campus if it was an international house, even though, of course, black people are citizens of both the state and the nation. There's, right. I mean, nothing necessarily right international about them. Um, and so, I mean, I think it was, I think it was revelatory. And, yeah. um, and I think it speaks to, I mean, we were supposed to do this work in just a couple of weeks. We ask for an extension. This is really work that institutions need to invest in and continue to do continuously this work of thinking through their history and thinking about the ways in which their practices have created tremendous inequities. You know, in our first uh, uh, series event, when we were talking about Bidet Makaska, we, we actually got to the point where two of the people who are the historians who are doing some of this research noted that they had their credentials questioned because this was a change, a, a, a moment of social change, but that they were, you know, women of color. Did you experience that, David Chang? I would guess that as a body, Melinda Lindquist, myself, and the rest of the committee did. Um, we had not only our, our, our qualifications, but our good faith called into question. We actually had our intellectual honesty called into question because people were seeking a secret agenda. And part of this, this was revealing to me, and it was something that became clearer to us as the process went along. As the document, the call for more and more research and more and more documentation and the longer and longer report grew as we went along. And I suspect in retrospect that that was because if people were aware this was going to be politically explosive with some members of the university committee and the, 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 among the regents and, and in the state. And so people were looking for more and more. And so, so to a certain extent, there became in some members' minds the need to create an infallible legal brief to find the smoking gun. And um, in another the kind of a sense, that this would be overwhelming. But the fact is, as researchers dealing with history, we know that we are dealing with an inherently incomplete record. Everybody at the Minnesota Historical Society realizes that too. The historical record is incomplete. You do your best. And we came as university researchers doing our best with the assumption that people would understand because we work with faculty and we work with administrators who are also researchers who understand that one works, one does one's best with an inherently um, incomplete historical record, right? And then we come up with our recommendations. But then we were faced with like, people who disagreed with us, not with the attitude that we're used to. It's like, I disagree with you and I would like to point out such a, but rather a sense that we had been intellectually dishonest, that we came in with knives sharpened in order to bring down heroes, which is truly not at all what we were doing. So yes, we are, it was, it was not only our skills our competence that was called into question. I do think it was our character as well. What, when we think about this, uh, Melinda, in terms of history, so this is this was an effort to change names that was an act of, there was activism involved, there was organizing involved, but there was also an act of history committed here too, with all of the research that Jay and this committee did. Is that the rub, is that the conflict? If you're using, in researching history to allow you to be active in trying to make change, is that somehow incongruent with what we're supposed to do with history or use history? If you, I don't know if I've made that question clear, but I don't, do you see what I'm going for with that question? I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that there's necessarily a tension there. I mean, I will say going into the process, um, our committee, really did depend on the work of the of the Coleman committee that David was on previously in terms of they had sort of set up a set of values. And I would say the other thing we did is we actually read the reports of a number of other different institutions that 
had done this work, had, had done this work before us. And so I think we wanted to, we took those models um, incredibly seriously. At the same time, we also took the students' um, interest in building renaming very seriously. I mean, the whole reason that we had this charge um, came out of the students' the students' activism. Um, but I think that seeing how other institutions were handling this issue and then using those principles, um, you know, we came up with our recommendation, which the president um, adopted. And I think that you know, history is. Is powerful, and it, I think it's in, it's incredibly, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a usable, it's a sort of usable past, um, and I think maybe part of the challenge is in um, doing that work. I think mean, clearly part of the challenge was in doing that work to the board of regents. Um, there was a there was a regent, um, you know, Regent Amari. He voted to change the name, and then there were eleven eleven other regents that. That voted not to change the name, um, and I think, I think part of the work of history and of scholars is to continue to be in these conversations about how race works. And I think that this report is this first conversation that we had with the Board of Regents. I do think that per, that President Kaler anticipated a very different conclusion. Um, I think that he did not completely anticipate um, the, the range of resistance that he was going to get. I mean, I, I would say especially, especially from regents who would sort of continue to come back to this argument about, well, this is just how people sort of were thinking in the past. Um, and there was, I think, in that like a, a real sort of privilege of how a set of a set of white administrators, you know, were thinking in the past and really sort of missing the ways in which um, an in, actually an interracial student body was was thinking in other directions around issues of of broader equity um, within the university. It was it was a lopsided vote, as you noted, and at this point we're going to actually bring in our our first two guests to uh, who you saw at the beginning of the event here, Jay Yates and Katie McCleary, um, because we have our Q and A section that I want to open up to the audience um, as well. And uh, well, let's just bring up that first question if we can, uh, as we bring Jay. Also, I, I know our technician behind uh, behind backstage is is working a lot there, but we do have a couple questions from the audience. One of the points of tension related to the U of M. Uh, matter was the drive by the regents to adopt language and framing from private colleges and institutions. Do you feel there are differences in the way private higher ed institutions and public land grant institutions might handle issues of memorialization and naming? Katie, I saw you nodding there as I read that. What uh, I'm going to put you on the spot there and get your thoughts on that question. No, I was just thinking that I, I, I guess this is just an interesting example because Yale is a private institution versus University of Minnesota. Um, and I was thinking that um, uh, resources can look very different. Um, and yeah, but I don't have like a full fledged response. So I'd sure. actually defer no. to the rest of the panel. <laughs> well, I'd throw it out. And if anyone wants to jump in there. I think there's a difference, but it's a little less different than I thought there would be. Because when I hear you talk about the Yale Corporation, Katie, and then I think about our Board of Regents, it's a force that you didn't really think about most of your college career. And the Board of Regents are a force that I don't know about other faculty, but I found that other members of the committee had not expected that voice to be so powerful. And so it was a lesson in structural power. Um, uh, and it appears that you confronted that power and, you know, so did we. Um, Jay, I was just wondering, you know, we talked before you came back on about how lopsided that vote was. I don't know if that was as surprising to you as it was to uh, our two faculty members here, but one of the regents who voted against the name change, the, the, the names change, um, said this, we're spending way too much time on this particular issue. If we all spent this much time on the budget, we'd actually be able to solve problems. What is your reaction to that? Um, first of all, I think that's hilarious given how inactive the regents have been on other issues that students have brought to them about inequality on campus regarding like funding for different departments, regarding 
just like general inequity for students. Um, I know that like the people that run Nutritious U had, you know, asked for more resources and had been trying to get more stuff um, so that they could serve students who are not, you know, these legacy students with lots of money that are paying for school. It's, it's wild to bring up budget in that context because the U historically has not cared about that until like students were asking them to like care about this one particular issue that they're only bringing that up as like a gotcha. And I think that at the U students in this sort of like new generation, I guess, of, of students have also really thought about the structure of power as it exists in a way that I think that we weren't thinking about that um, at the initial name change um, kind of discussions. Like, I don't think that we realized how powerful the regents are and like how, how powerful, they, how powerful they are and also how disconnected they are from like actual student life um, and like day-to-day -day operations at the university. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but I think that the 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 understanding of like who really controls operations at the university and like who really controls like public facing um, issues at the university is the regents. And I think that that's something that we didn't think about um, at first um, and that I think students are more aware of now. So and, was there, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, and I would only add that I think that for many of us, the students and faculty, um, for us, we saw naming as a sort of a first important step and sort of signaling about the institution's willingness to really take seriously the different types of um, racial practices and surveillance it participated in the past, that this was not, the, the names are not the end, that they are, they are the beginning and that that work, not only that the work itself in terms of the institution recovering its history and wrestling with its history is important, um, but also continuing to wrestle with the current inequities within the institutions between you know, departments in terms of the different rates of success of our different um, student populations, that, that, that naming is a, is a, is a part um, of a much larger set of work that needs to be done. And so I think, and I don't think, I know that the, uh, the task force report that we we put forward actually has a section at the end, which is about very specifically um, beyond naming. David? Yeah, oh, oh go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to jump in really quickly and say that I think it was really similarly at Yale, I, it's hard for me to separate the um, demands that we had at the administration to put more resources towards you know, say ethnic studies to uh, double the cultural center budgets. Um, it's hard to separate those from the renaming. They're very linked for me because I think that they, it is about um, a resource allocation. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to add too that at Yale at least, we have thing, seen buildings names change very quickly by donors. <laughs> so when, it just depends, you know, how much how much money do you have? How much power do you have? That is going to decide. And that, you know, totally, the L Corporation has changed many building names at the request of donors. David, I'm just curious, when this process was set up, I get that there was a lot of history researched about these these leaders is especially transgressions right places where they they were exclusionatory and and here's the case did any part of this process um make a case for them for keeping the names was there was there a committee um charged with i don't know trying to defend it it, it is actually something we heard last time with justice page school that the students actually made sure that when they put a ballot out for people to pick the name that Ramsey, who had been the name, was one of the people on the ballot. They actually made sure that Ramsey was still an option. Was there, was there any dynamic like that here? We made a point in our report to have a section thinking about the real contributions in the case against changing. And, the, and that was, and they were that, you know, for example, that um, uh, Middlebrook was a great institution builder, you know, and that, and, and that, and Kaufman had done a lot to of uh, to extend the reach of the university and to include new students, you know, kind of um, across uh, class lines within w the white Minnesotan world, and so on and so forth. So we really did make a point of trying to 
include in the report the argument for keeping this name. Um, in the end, for each of these, we, we had to, we, we, we came on on another on another side. But the, of course, these were recommendations. This was a report to the president, and so it needs to be recalled that the re, the, the report that was brought, the recommendations that were brought to the, to the regions, was the president's um, that was prepared at his behest by some of his faculty. But the argument definitely was made for keeping these names. We do have another question um, from our audience. Uh, let's bring that up here. Uh, how do you see this issue as framed with the current diversity issues facing Minnesota? Uh, I hope your regents uh, will become uh, better educated. Best wishes on your efforts. Uh, that, of course, is the commentary side of that comment. But what, what, how do you see that issue framed, um, Melinda? Um, I mean, I think in terms of diversity, I mean, the, the university has, has a lot of work to do around these issues. Um, it has a lot of work to do, not only around um, supporting certain departments and programs, um, but also supporting um, our increasingly diverse student body. And I would say, especially in the wake of the pandemic where we have seen these sort of shifts, right? Especially um, with fewer international students and the University of Minnesota in particular, um, admitting um, more, student, more students that are local and also an increasingly diverse student body. It's really important that we are ensuring not only that as we that we're bringing them into the university but that they have a sense of belonging in the university they have a sense of of ownership that they're not just being included but they really see themselves um, as being able to sort of make and reshape the institution in ways that support them and in ways that they know will support uh, future students and so again I think um, it's the students that are, and I and I would say it's a real mo multiracial group of students um, that have been pushing for these types of changes and that are going to continue to hold um, the university's feet to the fire as they should, as they should, because that is that is important work um, that they're doing, and the and the institution needs to be responsive um, to those demands. We are in our final minutes here. I just want to get any final thoughts. It's kind of uh, open mic night here as we as we end here, as we end this conversation with the consideration that there are people, uh, and I kind of asked this of Jay and Katie earlier, but there are people watching who maybe are embarking on this, um, or any other thought you have as we uh, as we end the conversation here. Katie, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think that um, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about during this conversation is just um, how um, the, how exhausting this can be for students. And I just hope that um, all of the students who are part of this work at University of Minnesota and faculty as well are taking care of themselves. And um, I just um, hope that these do start to, to um, create more change. David, I'll go to you next. Um, that names do matter because they're part of a larger agenda of how an institution expresses itself. And um, that it's fine for an institution to change and it's appropriate for an institution to change. And when that happens, it is appropriate and fine for an institution to change its naming policies. It need not even be a condemnation of somebody who it was named after in the past, but simply that the institution has changed and needs to express itself in a new way. And hopefully, in a way that fits and includes the, the the people that we want to be in the future. Jay, I'll go to you next. Um, yeah, I think that for me, kind of moving forward and in, in a different role as like a postgraduate, almost like uh, activist at the U, um, I I think it's been really encouraging for me to see uh, students reconnecting with like the roots of militant um protest at, at the u because the u has such a rich history with that and um i'm glad that sort of the research that i helped with um reconnected students to that history and that past but i think that that's really going to be a way forward of of students really demanding that the university 
reflect its majority and not just its richest donors and not just its its most um, profitable students. Well, you, if you're interested, as you're listening here for the, our audience, look up Moral Hall 1969 at the University of Minnesota. You'll get it, what Jay is talking about uh, as well, the takeover of Moral Hall. And Melinda, last but not least. Uh, well, first, I just want to—I want to thank you for for having me, and I, I want to thank um, Jay and Katie for your incredible leadership. And I want to say to students out there, and young people, or whoever is embarking on this work and are thinking about sort of the different aspects of our society that we need to, you know, sort of essentially defund um, and seriously wrestle with, do that work and um, know that it is going to be challenging. Um, and as Katie was saying, I think, you know, find a caring community that can support you in those efforts because there will be times where you will meet great success and there will be times where you um, will, will not meet success. Um, but even when you don't have a success, and we might say the University of Minnesota, um, the names of the, <laughs> of the buildings clearly were not changed. Um, we have seen other changes that have taken place in the sort of in that portion of the report that's the beyond naming. Um, so we have a president, a new president who has made real commitment to ensuring that we will have some, David and I, for example, will have new colleagues joining us who will be coming to the university and will are coming into a position that is very specifically about around the questions of university and power. We have the College of Liberal Arts and the university now having a new requirement around um, race, justice and power um, as a course requirement for all students. And so sometimes you might think um, something has, has failed um, and maybe that specific part of it has failed, but it doesn't mean that it won't sort of engender new types of transformations. Well, thank you and miigwech to all of you for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Uh, as again, we have a survey that we have a link to here. We'd love to hear your feedback. And one final note, our final program, this is a four-part series. Our final one will be May 13th, and we'll be discussing renaming and Henry Sibley's legacy. Feel free to Google Henry Sibley's name if you don't know that history um, before that conversation. Check out our Facebook page and all of our um, events uh, as we'll be putting out word about that event. But we hope to see you there at May, on May 13th as well. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for this conversation.